Remember how happy the Democrats were one year ago? When they had just unexpectedly won both Georgia Senate races, so they were going to be the ones holding all the reins and levers and apparatuses, apparati of power. And were they in the least bit deterred by the fact that they had a razor-thin majority in the House and no majority to speak of in the Senate? No, they were not. You remember all those big plans they had back then. They were going to build back better. They were going to pass the mother of all pork barrel infrastructure bills. They were going to pack the Supreme Court, usher D.C. and Puerto Rico into the Union, defeat the Sun Monster, end racism, trans the kids, give everybody free everything forever, print brand new fictional money to pay for everything. And they were going to do all this while simultaneously shutting down the virus and administering the Fauci ouchie to every man, woman, and child in the country, whether they like it or not. But as a wise man once said, reality can be a hell of a cruel mistress. So today, a, a mere 360-some days since the giddy halcyon highs of last February, Joe Biden has abandoned his domestic agenda for all intents and purposes. His approval numbers are beginning to approach late-period George W. Bush levels of public discontent, and that's really saying something, because it took W seven years and two failed wars to start plummeting into the 20th percentiles. But our man Corpsey Cadaverton has managed to pull that off in just a mere fraction of the time. So don't let it be said that our president is incapable of achieving historic firsts at lightning speed, because this man is the Usain Bolt of geriatric doofuses who crap in their pants from time to time. Allegedly. Does anybody have a contact at the Vatican? We should ask the Pope whether it's true or not. I don't think woke Frank would lie to us, would he? So, needless to say, Joe Biden needs to do something, anything, to turn this ship around and make himself look like a man who possesses a basic level of professional competence in the only field in which he's ever worked. So, for the last couple weeks, he's been kicking the tires on war with Russia, and... Nobody's more happy about it than the Ukrainians. I can picture President Zelensky now. Oh, okay, so, so you're just goading the Russians into invading us, practically daring them to do it because you think that gives you a chance to... to what, rush in and pretend to be some great peacemaker and statesman? And, you know, if our little Eastern European democracy has to get sacrificed on the altar of your desire for better poll numbers... Well, I guess, as always, we Ukrainians are here to help. Just just like when you and your crackhead kid and your scumbag brother spent four years using our country's economy as a Biden family ATM machine. And then Joe says, Nope, that's just about the long and short of it, little shaver. And now brace for impact, fella. I'm telling you, that, that Red Army is going to be on your doorstep before you know it. And then Zelensky says, Hey, idiot, there, there hasn't been a Red Army for over 30 years, so... so and that's so long ago, you were only in your fourth term in the Senate. And then Joe says, What are you talking about, no Red Army? I just got off the phone with Gorbachev. But sadly, a pointless war with Russia must not have been scoring very well in the focus groups. Either that or the White House couldn't think of a good answer for the question, So you want us to send our sons to lay down their lives defending Ukraine's border when it's the official position of your government that securing our own border is racist? So with that plan off the table for now, Joe needed to pivot to something else. Fast, something foreign, something involving the military, something where he can stand up there and pretend to be a real man and a strong, decisive leader. So, fine, whatever, you won't let me have my war with Russia, but... Can I at least kill a terrorist or something? Come on, man. And so, Thursday morning, up strode our man Joe to the podium where he announced that, on my direction, which is how presidents always open when they're announcing a successful operation, but never a failed one, our special forces liquidated some ISIS leader in Syria somewhere. And since this was a Joe Biden operation, half a dozen women and children got whacked in addition to the seven male terrorists, so... What we have here is the geopolitical equivalent of a football coach who's on the hot seat with the owner, who's at risk of missing the playoffs, and his team just eked out a 7-6 to six victory. His team scored one touchdown, the other guy's got two field goals. And he's standing up there in the post-game press conference, acting like it was a brutal ass-kicking they just inflicted on the opponent. And things like, things like this were so much better with Trump, not just because 
of the Trumpian histrionics. He died like a dog, he died like a baby, like a weak little cowardly baby, like a trembling little pansy-ass pussy. God bless America! But also because we could then look forward to fawningly hagiographic hey, obituaries of the dead terrorist from CNN and the New York Times and so on. He was an austere religious scholar, a devoted husband and father, a cat lover who enjoyed model railroading. A man who was struggling to leave behind the terrorist life, who wanted to go to school and become a paralegal or an EMT. But tonight his seven children have no daddy, and his widows weep inconsolably, for their husband has been taken from them by the bad orange man. <laughs> From high atop the battlements of Castle Kermotion, where slaying your enemies in battle isn't just a motto, it's a way of life. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all ships at sea, welcome to the program. Happy Friday. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And I suppose we should have known all along how, how it would, that it would, was going to be the truckers who wound up saving us from all of this biosecurity police state insanity. When there is a problem that calls for a reminder of the importance, nay, the primacy, of rugged individualism and the basic right of free men to determine their own destiny? Whom do you call to take charge of that situation? Well, you call the most ruggedly individualistic men among us, that's who. The men who are the heirs of the men who drove the wagon teams, the oxen and the horses and the mules across the wild prairie, and tamed an entire continent. And I don't think we need to make any distinction here between American and Canadian. Because rugged individualism is one of the, of the central defining traits of both our peoples. And it's one of the best ones. They used it to tame the top half of the continent, we used it to tame the bottom half, and they were working in much shittier conditions most of the time, so I think they're even entitled to a few bonus points. And it's no less true today than it was 150 years ago, when we were just starting to settle and populate the West Coast and the North American interior, that the whole thing goes to shit pretty fast if you don't have the ability to reliably move people and goods over land over long distances. They used to be men with wagons and draft animals, and we called them teamsters. Today they are men with 18-wheel Macs and Peterbilts, and we call them truckers. But yeah, go ahead, Justin Trudeau. Go ahead, Joe Biden. Try to run a country where the truckers have walked off the job. See what that does to your supply chain problems. If you want to see what a real insurrection looks like, piss off the truckers and then see what happens when your people are not able to buy basic necessities. Speaking of Justin Trudeau, is he still cowering in fear in an undisclosed location like he was at the start of the week? Because that is an outstanding look, dude. That, that, that look is almost as good as blackface. It really makes you look like a strong leader, a man of action, when you literally go into hiding from a group of legitimately aggrieved citizens who've done nothing wrong except to be opposed to your idiotic policies. I uh, Does he really not understand how bad that looks? Because that's the sort of thing that can damage your reputation so badly you lose the ability to govern effectively, not that he possessed it in the first place, but I digress. Not that he ever... Uh, but it could, could it be that Justin Trudeau has been playing the role of the beta cuck douchebag for so long that he's lost the ability to locate his testicles even when his political future rests on being able to find them? And you have to, you have to give that to him, at least. This guy plays the role of the beta cuck douchebag absolutely to the hilt for all it's worth because go big or go home, right? And then our man Justin has has this unique mixture of effete femininity and greasy, sleazy polit politician sliminess. I can't listen to the guy for five minutes without feeling like I urgently need to take a shower, li like I need to tell the nice lady where the where the on the doll where the bad man touched me. That, that, that's what I feel when I watch Justin Trudeau. The, the dude makes Emmanuel Macron look like Danny Trejo. Also, I have to say this to millennial men. Please stop wearing suit jackets that are two sizes too small and shirts with ridiculous tiny collars because you look stupid. But it looks like matters are coming to a head in Canada and, and the protest is having the desired effect because the provincial governments of Alberta and Saskatchewan are, are now talking about dropping all of their COVID restriction. Even even Quebec is starting to walk things back. 
A couple of weeks ago, they had this big plan for levying punitive taxes against the unvaccinated, but they've they've abandoned that plan now. And, and seriously, how long have I been saying it? There is no way we are going to obey our way out of this thing. The only path to getting our old lives back is through mass noncompliance. And yes, I, I'm a bit surprised it was the Canadians who figured it out before we did. That They were the ones who actually mustered the courage to mark a line in the sand and make the coward public health tyrants back down and scurry back into their little rat holes. But at least somebody is doing it. And hey, if we need to follow the example of the Canadians, if we need the monarchists to our north to teach us about the principles of freedom and the value of civil disobedience, then... I say let those royalty-loving maple syrup syrup drinking hosers be an example to us all because evidently we are in need of one. But I'm happy to report the message appears to be getting through for... I was informed earlier that we've got our own good old-fashioned American trucker protest in the works, which apparently is going to happen in Los Angeles on Super Bowl Sunday. And there's another one in D.C. I'm informed that, that... the Super Bowl is the championship game of something called the National Football League, but since I'm not a fan of that sport, I will have to take other people's word for it. But wouldn't it be delightful if the whole event got ruined by tens of thousands of patriotic truckers showing up and getting in everybody's way? Oh, oh what's that, Mr. Mr. Richie Rich Hollywood Elite? You paid 20 grand each for your Super Bowl tickets, and now you can't get to the stadium? Gosh. I really am sorry about that. I really feel bad for you. But hey, maybe you can take off one of your double masks and use it to soak up your tears as it's the start of the third quarter and you're still sitting in a traffic jam. So yeah, I I think it's fair to say I'm looking forward to Super Bowl Sunday now, but but it's the trucker bowl I really care about, frankly. It's fine if the Canadians are the ones setting the example we're emulating, but having said that, We need to outdo our cousins to the north. We need to make this the worst day in Eric Garcetti's miserable little life. Even worse than the day he was forced to kneel down in the middle of the street on live television and recite the official Black Lives Matter white man blood guilt oath. And speaking of sporting events I can no longer be bothered with, the Genocide Olympics are... I think they're beginning tonight or last or something. Who Who cares? That's how many fucks I don't give about the Olympics. And much like how I'm only looking forward to the Super Bowl because I want to see it ruined by trucker nation, I'm only looking forward to the ethnic cleansing winter games to see how anemic the TV ratings are for our good friends at NBC. If there has been any positive side effect of the China virus pandemic, it has at least hastened the downfall of the modern Olympic movement, which cannot come soon enough. There are few institutions on this planet that are more corrupt, more odious, more malevolent than the International Olympic Committee. A world in which that rotten edifice has been torn down and no longer exists? Well, in my opinion, that is a better world. That world has improved itself. I made that same remark in some comment thread recently, and this guy replies whining to me about, you can't get rid of the Olympics because then all these sports won't exist anymore. And it reminded me a lot of the guy who said, you can't get rid of the Department of Education, then the public schools will disappear. I could have been the same guy for all I know. Because it certainly is the same dubious thought process. But no, amazingly enough, all all of those obscure sports would still exist even if the Olympics went by the wayside. They would still all have their world championships every year. There just wouldn't be any every four years mega event that encapsulates all of them in one place. And if you really enjoy watching ice dancing and speed skating and biathlon that much, it'll still be out there. Nobody's preventing you from watching it. And besides... It wouldn't be long before something else came along that replicated what the Olympics used to be, something that's free of all the baggage that that sticks to the IOC like stink on shit. But the modern Olympic movement, it, it just has to go. Sometimes things have to go. It has run its course, no pun intended. The IOC, it's not a thing that can be rehabilitated, just like CNN can't be rehabilitated. And sometimes you have to tear a thing down and start over, and there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is to keep going through the motions from just force of habit when you know this thing you're supporting is rotten to the core and hostile to its own stated principles. And since we're on the subject of bad things happening in China, I just finished reading Peter Schweitzer's latest tome. 
the current holder of the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list, entitled Red-Handed, How American Elites Get Rich Helping China Win. This is an important book, one I can't recommend highly enough. Not because I was particularly surprised by the revelations it contained. It was mostly about what I expected, but because it's a valuable compendium, a, a well-researched, well-sourced, single-resource, meticulously footnoted that lays out the full extent of China's malign influence on our country. And he, he lays it out sector by sector. He starts out with the Biden family. They get their own dedicated chapter because they deserve it, because there's never been a presidential family that's this corrupt, just broadly speaking, and it's even more noteworthy and remarkable when the majority of their ill-gotten gains have come directly from our hostile communist adversary. And then he does a section on Capitol Hill, and we already know most of the worst offenders there. We know all about Eric Swalwell banging a Chinese spy and not even losing his spot on the Intelligence Committee. We know about Diane Feinstein having her car driven for 10 years by a Chinese spy, for which she faced no consequences. And the current Senate Minority Leader, who's in so deep with China, we might as well start calling him Mitch the Mandarin McConnell, but the roster goes a lot deeper than that, and Schweitzer, he's got all the receipts. And there, there's a section for Silicon Valley and, and the big tech oligarchs, a section for Wall Street, a section for the diplomatic corps and, and the administrative deep state. There's a section devoted specifically to the Bush and Trudeau families. The Bush stuff you probably already have at least a passing familiarity with, but if you're unfamiliar with Pierre Trudeau, and, and the extent to which his sinophilia and abiding love of communism got passed down largely unaltered to his greasy douchebag kid. There's some stuff in there that you might find pretty shocking. The, and then there's a section devoted to higher education, or what we used to call higher education. Now it's more like the predatory lending scheme that doesn't give you an education, but does turn you into a perfect little Bolshevik. And then the final section, which I found regrettably short, frankly, is on how we ought to go about fighting back and extricating the machinery of our own society from the malign influence of our foreign enemy. If I have any complaint about the book, I think it's more about the format than anything else. I, I would have preferred, I think, more of a chronological narrative structure rather than compartmentalized sector by sector, family by family, but that's a trifling complaint. The, the obvious starting point if you wanted to do it that way, would be Tiananmen Square in 89, followed in 92 and 93 by the decision to give China most favored nation status and allow them into the WTO. When, when all the globalists, Republicans, Democrats alike, the Bush 41 administration and the Clinton administration, all of them, they swore up and down that normalizing trade relations with China would cause their country to liberalize and eventually to abandon communism. And that was the pretext for the entire exercise. Some people, though far too few of them, knew all along it was a bad idea. They knew what the worst case scenario would look like and that it was likely to materialize, but as always, they were shouted down as heretics and racists and conspiracy mongers. My only other minor complaint is that I wish there had been a section devoted to professional sports and specifically the NBA. He does make mention toward the end of the book of, of the incident in which the GM of the Houston Rockets, whose name I don't remember, Daryl something or other, when he innocently tweeted out his support for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong, and everybody else in the, in, in the league just started clutching their pearls and rending their garments like he had just come out as a child molester or something, because rule number one in the NBA Book of Good Conduct says you must never, under any circumstances, even implicitly, say anything unfavorable about the Chinese Communist Party. If you want to trash the President of the United States or the American people generally, that's totally fine. But damn it, you leave the Chinese Communists alone if you want to keep your job. So the, the, the Rockets GM was forced to make one of those pathetic John Cena apology hostage videos. Me so sorry, me no meaning so communism, me beg forgiveness. But it doesn't matter, they wound up firing his ass anyway, because you tell me. I, I, I'm powerless to figure out how the finances pencil out for the NBA, unless there's a massive ongoing transfusion of cash coming from some unknown mysterious source. 
the NBA played a 2020-21 season in which they sold a grand total of zero tickets. And since they've decided to go down the road of leftist virtue signaling, they've got at least half the people in the country who find their product utterly revolting now, and because of it, they had the most dismal TV ratings since back in the days when the NBA was so culturally irrelevant they showed the finals on tape delay. After a season like that, would you expect player salaries to go up? I wouldn't, but they did. Within days of the end of this zero-ticket, low-rated season, LeBron James signs a contract with the Lakers for $50 million for one year. That's 625000 per game. And where is the revenue coming from that can support salaries like that? Because it ain't coming from ticket sales or TV ratings. But nobody in the NBA will dare say anything remotely unfavorable about China or the Communist Party. So you do the math and get back to me. And we arrive then at the close of another week. I hope yours was agreeable. Here is wishing everyone a delightful, edifying weekend. I will see you back here on Monday. Thanks very much for watching. Until next time, do not comply. Get off my lawn.